Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not an expert. I'm a human being. <laughs> I'm actually an optician. Uh, so if anyone needs glasses, I'm up at the Walmart up in Arden. <laughs> Just shameless plug. Uh, they always tell you when you're doing public speaking to do something that they're going to remember you by. Um, I can't tell jokes. And I can't... Well, actually, let's try one. Why did the butterfly cross the road? No, I'm asking, why did the butterfly... See, I can't. But, in order for you to remember, I wore these shoes just for you. Uh, my program is... Uh, Brad's backyard. I do. A, uh, I'm not doing it this year because I'm giving my uh, backyard a little break. Um, let me see if I. Ah, there it is. Okay, uh, Johnny Milkweed Seed. Um, this program is going to describe how we um, can. Well, what I do in my backyard. Most everything I do, I just heard today or this week, a um, uh, person in the news said, uh, we do truth, not fact. So I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you the truth about my backyard. Just keep this in mind, okay? Okay. Okay. Now, first I want to talk about Nature. Now, in nature, obvious. Oh, by the way, uh, by the end of this, about 85% of you will be offended. <laughs> so I do want to take, say, apologize to the 15% that are not going to be offended, uh, because I'm an equal opportunity offender. However, you can't offend everybody. So, um, in nature, typically the male of the species is much more grandiose, beautiful, if you may. Uh, you can see by the long mane and. Uh, then the female doesn't have the mane, and she actually looks kind of upset right now, so I'm sure he did something. Um, this is another mane animal. Um, as you can see, the, the beautiful jawbone, and um, so, but we do have the female. Now, although she is beauty in her own way, she does have to adorn herself in order to compete. Um, but now with every rule of nature, there is also the exception. Uh, this is called the wife. <laughs> Very gorgeous. Um, now one more. This is, of course, the peacock. And you can see the beautiful uh, plumage and the gorgeous blue. Uh, and then we have the female. <laughs> and that usually takes about... 48 to 52 percent of my population already offended. So we're on a good roll. Butterflies are a little different. This is a male butterfly. Now with a monarch butterfly, you can tell a monarch male from these two spots here. There is talk as to it does have pheromones and other places I read it does not. But it has a thinner uh, veins in the uh, in the wings, and then the female, as you can see, it has the larger, larger veins, but very similar. I mean, you have to really look um, in order to see, um, you know, to find those little spots, because sometimes when the wing is closed, uh, it's not that easy to see. Um, some of the butterflies that we have in this area, brushfoot, uh, which is not a monarch, uh, but we have the fritteraries, uh, Vanessa's, Admirals, Checker Spots, Painted Ladies, Morning Cloaks, things like that. Uh, the Red Spotted Purple, which is a gorgeous butterfly, is also in this uh, group here. Um, now these are interesting because uh, they have, their, their front legs are useless, so they only have four legs. And they're used to clean their, their antenna and their proboscis. A um, couple examples of proboscis. Uh, have the, uh, that's um, elephant. Uh, we have the anteater, uh, one that is unfortunately extinct. Uh, we have the Durante, 
Uh, this is commonly known as the great Schnozola. Um, I will attempt his call because um, he had a very unique call. It goes something like this. Um, ink, got ink, got ink, I didn't got ink, I didn't got do. Now that's a drop. <laughs> and the butterfly. This is a very important thing to remember during this program. Uh, this is how they feed through that little tube. All butterflies have that. Um, now, uh, probably the most common that you're going to notice all the time are going to be the, the swallowtails. Um, not so much the giants, but you have the eastern black swallowtail, spice bush, eastern tiger, the zebra, and the pipe vines. Now, the pipe vine is a real interesting one because it's got an iridescent blue. But don't be confused with the red spotted purple, which also has a black wing and iridescent blue. The difference is the pipe vine has the tail, the signature tail of uh, the swallowtails. I don't have any pictures of that because we're not talking about these guys anyway. <laughs> um, now we have four different types of milkweed butterflies, which is where the monarch falls into. Uh, we have the monarch, which is found throughout North America. Uh, the queen, typically it's western California, uh, west of the, uh, I, I guess the Rockies. Um, soldier, which I live in South Florida, I never knew about them and I never saw one, but those are in South Florida and Texas. And then very, very extreme Florida is the tiger, I mean the large tiger. Again, I've never seen those two before. I have seen the queen. So this is uh, your uh, common mo uh, monarch. This is, our, this is the one we have here and this is the one that I deal with and this is the one that does the major migration. Uh, this is uh, the queen. Again, you see the spots. And once again, this is the soldier and this has the spots also. And then the large tiger, which does not look like a regular monarch. White monarch. Never saw one of those, did you? You're not going to unless you go to Hawaii. Uh, the only place that these um, breed and live is uh, University of Hawaii oh. in uh, Oahu, I think it is. Um, but they have a breeding population there. They're trying to get more of them. But it's it's quite um, it's quite interesting. Some people think that I forgot to put the color in. So um, what Babs was talking about was the migration when you go down and you see where they where they overwinter. Actually, a lot of this. You can see this also in California, uh, but these are the, the trees in, uh, you know, in the um, Mexico. Uh, they just cover. I have never seen it. I'm going to. It's on my, it's on my honey. I'm, okay. That's a lot of butterfly. Monarchs are the only ones that migrate to any extent. Um, I think I missed one here. Okay, we go here. Okay, yeah, this is, uh, it's got a pointer here. Look at this. It's pretty cool. See, I'm not nervous. Um, okay, so we're right here. We're right here. Uh, as you can see, this is the track of our butterflies going up. We get hit with butterflies here typically in about May, uh, going uh, north. Uh, they start, in, start down here, and this is where they overwinter. Uh, this is in the uh, Michoacan Mountains of Mexico. Uh, there's, it's not a huge area. There are a lot of places that they, there are, but there's not huge amounts of places um, where they are going to uh, over, over winter. Uh, but some of them go this way, some of them go this way. And then you have the, the California, and they go this way and then back. They don't travel down here. So
some of them may straggle, uh, but these. Now, one of the interesting things about this, let me get to this next slide here. Okay, so again, we see where the spring migration is. And it's like a, snow, it's like, it's like a wave or a, a snowball going uphill. Um, they start here, they get into Texas. This is where they start laying their eggs. And they, early March and April is when uh, that starts happening here. They lay their eggs, those go through their stages, which we'll go through, uh, and then they will start moving more north. We get them in May, um, but they don't stay here. They continue, they, but they'll, as they go, they look for milkweed and they mate uh, and they lay. And they continue to lay and they continue to lay. And there's actually, there's four generations. This is, the first, this is actually the start of the last generation. First generation, second generation, third generation, and then the fourth generation starts moving down. So as you can see, some of, now this is all, this is all documented and I'll tell you, tell you about the guy who did it. Um, this is, so they, they just, they're coming down this way. Do have some traveling from east of, of the Rockies, but west of the Rockies, they tend to move into California. I'm sorry, y'all, I'm in your way, aren't I? Want me to take that back? Okay. All right. Um, Fred Orquat, he's the, um, he's the guy who started this tagging thing. He's the guy who, had, as a little kid living in, in Canada, um, he would sit at the edge of uh, Lake Superior and watch butterflies. Monarch butterflies would fly from Canada and go over Lake Superior. Now, if anybody's seen Lake Superior, you know it's pretty big. Um, He's trying to figure out why that was. And this, he's, this is implanted in his head at the age of 12. Um, this says 17, but there's a really cool um, movie called Flight of the Butterfly. And you can probably pick it up on Netflix. And it gives this gentleman's uh, story. But he perfected the tagging. He started tagging them and tried to do all kinds of different types of tags. Uh, in 1940, he tagged them. Basically, it was the, the pressure sensitive tag that you use for um, you know, putting price tags on groceries and things like that. Um, he, for all these years, he did this. And in 1976, they found out where, through, where they actually were going because of all his tagging. And over the years, he would just write his phone number and they, or his address, and they would call, people would find these butterflies with the tag on them and call the guy. And he starts out you know, in Canada, and it starts going down, and then he starts seeing patterns of, of how, this, how this is working. And as you can see, the pictures of you know, where the mi mi migration is, um, that's what he found over years and years and years. Uh, but they finally found out where these things were going down in Mexico. And he went with National Geographic in 1976. And as he was sitting there looking and being amazed at all these butterflies all over the, uh, the trees and everything, he looked down and he found one of his tags. So, they've never found one of mine. Uh, founded the Insect Migration Association with his wife Nora. Uh, that is now called Monarch Watch, which is out of University of Kansas. Um, this is very interesting. Now, the monarchs fly about a mile up. And you see one or two, you'll go up to the parkway and you see them flying across the road. Um, you go, okay, how many could there possibly be? There's not that many. Uh, this, this is uh, Doppler radar in St. Louis. I think it's 2000, um, I think about five or six years ago. Um, they didn't know what this was. What they figured out what it was, was these are all butterflies picked up on radar. Now, the interesting thing is, this is 250 miles, this is 150 miles. You can't see them from the road, or you can't see them looking up. But there's so many of them, and they fly in huge swarms. 
What do the different colors signify? I don't know. That's just Doppler stuff. <laughs> I'm not an expert. <laughs> Uh, how many are there? Estimates in the last several years have been varied from 30 million coming from Mexico. Um, there are going to be 30 million, 50 million. Past couple of years, and they're expecting a good year this year. Uh, last year was a very good year. Um, everything has to do with how the weather is, if it's a cold, a cool spring, warm spring. Um, but going down, there's billions of butterflies going down. They don't make it. They don't all make it. Um, a lot can happen in nine months. Uh, so no one really knows. Um, some of the factors of decreased populations, loss of habitat, land development uh, is the big one because uh, you're losing farmland. Uh, but the other thing about farmland is, we'll get to that in a second. Um, logging, a lot of poaching of the logs of these trees, these big fir trees that they overwinter on uh, because they can make a lot more money than they can doing what they do. Um, and the areas are very remote, very remote. So it, um, they don't know when they're gonna go. It's like around here, they, they poach logs too. And all of a sudden you find a stand of logs that is gone. Uh, natu naturally occurring weather cycles and pesticides. Plus a couple of other things. Yeah, there you go. Mm. Roundup. Okay, Roundup. Um, it's a weed killer. What it does is kill weeds. It does it very effectively, very efficiently. Uh, I know there's a lot of stuff about uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, that gets into the political aspect, so I don't want to get into that. Um, it works. I use it. I have to use it for what I do because of the amount of, uh, amount of plants that I do and the areas that I have. Uh, but I don't use it, I don't spread it all over myself and then not shower. I, I do it the way the directions say. Who uses it? Anybody? Thank you. <laughs> Monsanto and Frankencorn. Okay, non selective herbicide, very efficient, negligible side effects. Um, what Monsanto has done is genetically modified corn, wheat, and soybeans. And they, they did it so that when you're spraying Roundup, which is that effective um, weed killer on these plants, that does not kill the plant, but it does kill the weeds. Corn, uh, corn fields have always been where, especially up where I'm from, Wisconsin, there was always milkweed, so there was always a lot of monarch butterflies. So that, that is part of that loss of habitat uh, because of that. Um, as, as far as GMO is concerned, um, we feed the world with this corn and wheat and soybeans. Uh, right now we're doing um, food for the poor is, is feeding the people in Colombia that are the refugees from uh, Venezuela. Uh, they get all their food for free, all these, and, uh, but they collect money to get the distribution up. It's a great organization if you like to give a little bit. If you don't want to use green um, Roundup and have it in your uh, garage or anything and have somebody see it, use this. <laughs> Something. Okay, Roundup. I have never seen Roundup kill a butterfly or a caterpillar. Not in, not in the whole time I've been doing this. But one of the most devastating ones, things that do, is that. There's a reason why her name was Gremlin. Because she turned into that, when she saw a butterfly. This is one of the nastiest little things that you're gonna find in the butterfly world. This is called the Technic Fly. This is what I lose most of the butter, my, my caterpillars with. Uh, it lays its egg on the, um, on the caterpillar, usually when they're about uh, maybe a quart, uh, half an inch long. And the uh, egg hatches, the larvae goes in, and it eats the uh, caterpillar from the inside out. A lot of times you don't even know that it happens until two days before it's going to come out of chrysalis. So, um, and I, this, is, this is the one thing that I lose most of my butterflies with. Um, 
Milkweed. Have this here. This is uh, the common milkweed. This one here. Uh, this one is uh, butterfly weed, and this one is rose milkweed. All of these are, are native in, the, in North Carolina. Uh, this one you're gonna see all over the place. It's a beautiful flower that you always see in the middle of fields that you don't wanna... What happened? Did I miss it? <laughs> uh, this is purple milkweed. Now this is a little less common. Um, it is native here, but you don't find it too often. This is one of my favorite because of the color of it is so beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and I do have, these are some examples of it. And I'll show you where, tell you where you can get any seeds of this stuff. Um, this is called uh, short green milkweed, also called antelope. Uh, this is uh, spider milkweed. This one only gets, I've got one of these and it's about, uh, about eight years old now. And it only gets about this tall and it comes out in spring. Right now, I mean, by, by July, it's gone. Poke milkweed. Oop. This is poke milkweed. This is also a native here, and this is uh, the, one of the shade milkweeds. This I have in the, my backyard because I don't have a lot of sun. Um, but this is a beautiful flower. It's very dainty. I uh, have not had any caterpillars on it, uh, but it, it does, um, they, when I do see one, I'm gonna be very happy. Uh, this is showy milkweed, and this is called world milkweed. There's about 150 or 110 or so different types of milkweed in the United States alone. Uh, there's, so there's ample ways. Of it, um, I don't know what he's doing in there. <laughs> That's a tiger swallowtail. Uh, these are the pods of milkweed. Uh, these are the seed pods. This is, everybody knows the seed pod of the milkweed. Um, important nectar plants. Now, uh, we've got the purple coneflower, uh, we have the black-eyed Susans. Um, zinnias are great. Uh, cosmos are terrific too. Bladderus, which is blazing star. Um, again, purple milkweed. Uh, this is Joe Pye. Joe Pye weed is a gorgeous, and we have a lot of that here, you'll see that everywhere. It's just that great big, you're driving along, and it's that big, huge uh, purple plume that you see. Uh, that's Joe Pye. There's several different ones. You have short ones, there are tall ones. Uh, I grow all this, I grow a lot of this stuff when I sell it at the um, farmer's market. Another shameful plug. Um, <laughs> this one is called uh, orange milkweed. Uh, this is a real cute one. This is, uh, I grow this too. This is it's just, it's, it's a very small and dainty. It doesn't take over like, uh, like a lot of the uh, orange milkweed. Orange. Yeah, it's a Robecchia. Uh, and this is uh, ironweed. This is again, something that you'll see in the fields. You'll see just a field and right in the middle of that field, you're gonna see this big purple plant about, about this big. It has a beautiful purple flower. That's gonna be your ironweed. I understand they used to use the stalks to make, make, uh, make kites with too. That's why they call it ironweed. Okay, um, some of my babies. Now this is Penta. Penta is really a super magnet uh, as far as nectar for monarchs specifically. They love it. They like the reds more than the whites, uh, but these, don't, these guys don't seem to be caring at that point. Um, now I also have some of the different types of uh, zinnias. Uh, there's a, the, you know, the cactus zinnias are the real flurry ones. Um, just any of them, but they do like go more towards the orange colors, uh, oranges and reds. Uh, that other one in there, that's uh, uh, that's a New England aster, which is also a terrific uh, nectar plant for them. Uh, now this is tropical milkweed. I don't put this as the one that's one that you're going to you know want to go and grow. Then this is a tropical here. The reason I don't. I use this primarily with what I do. However, and, and I do sell them uh, at this time of the year because if you want to have a monarch butterfly, chances are you're going to be able to get one on this. Get a, get a caterpillar and get an egg. Um, the problem with these is that after the first freeze, they're still not dead. After the second freeze, they're still not dead. So I've had, I've found caterpillars like this in the middle of November. It's a dead, it's a dead dog. I mean, it's just, it's not gonna, 
uh, it's not going to survive because it's not going to have the time because there's a, a length of time in which all this works. Um, so if you ever do get tropical milkweed, use it as an annual, pull it up. Pull it up October 15th. Don't let it continue to grow because you can have your butterfly go, all, or your caterpillars eat it all the way down to the ground and it'll, continue, and it'll pop right back up again in two weeks. Mm -hmm. So, um, and there's also in Florida, uh, this stuff is wild. And there is a, I can't pronounce it, but it's called OP, and it's a protozoa that is very dangerous and destructive to the monarch butterflies. And so the, the breeding colonies down in Florida pretty much all have this protozoa. Hopefully they don't come up here and spread it uh, because it is very devastating. Uh, that's a boyfriend and girlfriend. Um, I don't know what they're doing. This is a mating pair. Another mating pair. Uh, it's really neat. I can, you know, I've been doing this. I've been, I started doing butterflies when I was nine years old. I can look at one butterfly or I can look at a hundred butterflies. Every time I see a butterfly, I get excited as far as with monarchs because they're just so neat. Um, but this, I, I make mine do a lot of that. Uh, this young man, uh, he was not one of mine, but last, last year when I was working in my front yard, he flew in, and that's a Joe Pye, taking a break. If you notice, these wings, he's broken here, here. He's been real busy for a couple of weeks. A lot of girlfriends. I had a female fly and land near him, and he went crazy and went right after her. So you just, you know, they know what they're supposed to do. Okay, some more of the, the butterflies, um, the feeds. A uh, couple more. It's like your kids, you know. Your first kid, you take a lot of pictures. The second one, not so many. And the third one, can I get a picture for, from you, Lily? Now, this is Lane, um, right here. The, uh, you see the eggs coming out there? Uh, this next one, I think, is... There's some, that's, that's the eggs. In nature, they don't lay that many on one leaf. Uh, there's, that's a real good picture of it. And it's really fast. They'll lay, they'll swing up, lay it, and then, and then they're, they're all gone. Do they die after they lay it? No, he'll let, she'll lay a few more. Okay. But yes, they, they will, they, the generations do die, um, except for that last generation, which I'll get into as far as that. Um, there's some more. Now, these are all the ones that I'm, I've raised them. So what I do is I, I raise three generations during the year, uh, starting uh, usually in July. And I, mate the, uh, I get the eggs and caterpillars. I mate them uh, after they become butterflies. And then I grow, and then I grow another generation. Uh, this one has got very rambunctious and, and very, uh, in, you know, this, uh, the plant's only this big, so, and there was plenty more places for her to lay, but uh, I guess she just kind of liked that place. Now this is, this is really cool. This is, um, this is when they're coming out. Uh, they're in egg for about three days, four, or four days. Um, and they, uh, that's the head. And you can see this one here. The first thing they do after they come out of their egg is, um, eat the eggshell, and then they go to work. That needle is about an inch and a half, so you can see how small that is. Very hard to see them. Uh, it's a little bigger than a comma on a page. A lot of times when they lay and then they hatch, I don't even know how many I have for about five days, because that's when I'm able to start seeing them. A little Another to scale. Uh, and now these are getting a little bigger. This is this is uh, this one is already shed. This one, these two are about the same age, uh, but this one hasn't shed yet. So this one, and that one just came out of shedding. Different different stages of the caterpillar. These are called instars. There's four. Um, you'll see this one here, that size, and the next day, you'll have something that looks kind of like that. 
because and, and it's the same it's the same caterpillar. That's just a cool picture. I took all these pictures, by the way. So, um, so here's this is how I have to feed them at certain points. Uh, and yes, that is poop. They do three things: they eat, they grow, and they poop. And they poop a lot. Now, when they're real small, it's not a big deal. When they get this size, I'm working all the time. That's another angle to that one picture. Um, and again, this is... Okay, if you feed them too much, this is what will happen. Either that or this was one of my GMO milkweeds uh, that has caused this uh, genetic mutation. Um, I growing the milkweed to try to combat, you know, Roundup. Um, they're very large, uh, but this is this this ca uh, monarch butterfly caterpillar is about 22 days old, which is much older than they should be. Uh, as you can see, also they eat everything, so he's cleaning out the mortar <laughs> in my uh, fence. Um, <laughs> Don't let your dogs, your cats, or small or medium-sized children out when this, is, when this is going on in your yard because uh, it could be dangerous. Um, when they go into chrysalis, though, it's okay. You know, then everything is safe. Now, they don't look like the regular monarch butterfly uh, because this is a mutation. Um, <laughs> but on the good hand is they're much tastier than the regular monarch butterfly. So again, we have a caterpillar, and he's, he's about ready to do that. And if you can see, this is the, the uh, chrysalis. Um, when I do what I do, I have to have a lot of plants. These are all common milkweed. I, has, I have these growing in the yard. Uh, they come up every year. But that's not enough to feed them. And one of the problems with the common milkweed with the, with the caterpillars is when you have a very small caterpillar, their mouths can get, because of the milk in this milkweed, can get uh, caught in their mouths and they will actually die. So what I use is the, uh, and these are all milkweed plants back here. That's, that's the kind of scale that I work with here. Uh, there's about 300 back in here. And if you look here, this is a rose milkweed. Now this is, I use this for laying because this is a terrific one. Uh, it's very soft leaves. And what they will do is they will lay on this. Uh, this is the first thing that they eat. And then they uh, will travel to the next type. Now some people will say, oh, you can't change the milkweed in the middle of a, a cycle. Yes, you can. They don't care, just so it's a milkweed. You can't give them a... Yeah, you, you just can't give them anything else, like lettuce. You know, don't lettuce isn't going to help it. <laughs> you would save the lettuce. Uh, but here we start here, and then I go directly to the um, to the rose milkweed. And again, because of the scale that I do it on, uh, this grows so quickly and they get huge. And one caterpillar will take this whole thing down to nothing. Okay. And that. Oh, one other thing about the this. The uh, caterpillar stage is that little tiny caterpillar to that large caterpillar is 13 days. So it goes 4,000 times its weight and size in 13 days. And when you're doing 300 and 400 of them, uh, this is my uh, this is my breeding uh, area. Uh, what I will do is when I have the, the butterflies in the, the cage before I get to this stage, I'll have them fly around and I'll bring in some of these and the butterflies will just do what they naturally know how to do. And uh, then I go into this stage here. Uh, typically I have about 75 caterpillars in here. I fill this up with plants in the morning and at night when I get back home from work, there's nothing left just the stem. So they are ravenous eaters. What do you do for a living? <laughs> they don't taste real good either. So. 
Now, when you get a butterfly, when you get, when they get to the eight, you know, the thirteenth day, and you can time this, and, and it's it's pretty well accurate, and I'll explain why I what I, how I have to do it. Uh, but this is called the J. What will happen is on the thirteenth day, they'll stop eating, and what they'll do is they'll find some place to uh, lie, and they lie. Uh, horizontally under you know underneath something like a leaf or a twig or something and they'll stay there for about 12, 15 hours and then they'll drop down into this position here and this is called the J and they'll stay in this position here for say another another 13 hours or so and at that point the back splits they start doing a dance they don't need music either <laughs> and th this wiggles out and the skin will grow all the way up to here and uh, then they'll do this gyration and the, uh, the residual skin will fall off of there and then you have and then you have just the uh, well here's a here's a those are the jewels right there okay now I don't want to get crazy but when I saw this for the first time I looked at it and it looked just like Jesus so, I'm not trying to be. You know, just, at least it wasn't toast, you know. Now, this, uh, these are the containers that I use when I'm using when I'm taking them out of the big cages, and this is when they are getting just ready to go into uh, getting ready to chrysalis. So I load these up with a lot of food. And I only put about 10 or 15, I put about 15 or 20 in the, the bigger box, it's in about 10 here. And again, there's nothing left when I get back. And it's, you gotta just keep going. And, and there's a lot of, I won't say poop anymore, I'll say frass. There's a lot of frass. It has to be taken out uh, because if you don't take the frass out of there, uh, it can start spoiling and it can kill your butterflies. There's a bunch of J's, and that's what the, that's on the underneath uh, this here. And what I do, there's a couple more. Uh, what I do is I take them off of that and I put them on uh, just this uh, manila folder. And I put about 13 of them on here and then I put some with double sided tape. Um, and then I hang them and let them do what they do. They're typically in the chrysalis form for about, uh, about 11 days. And that one is just getting ready to go. I have a better picture of this, but I can't, or better pictures of this, but I can't find it right now. Uh, but this is what happens, and this is very, you don't see this very often when this thing breaks open. Uh, I was, you know, I was sat and watched them for 15, 20, 30, 40 minutes. Nothing happened. I go get a drink of water. I come back and boom. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, but this, what they do is they hang, and they hang for a couple hours, maybe an hour or two, depends on the, the temperature. Now you see these are all ready to come out, uh, and then these are uh, this one here. You can just still see it. Now this one over here. Remember that little fly? That's dead. I hate those things. <laughs> and then they come out and they look like this. Um, golden rod. When we have them here, we start getting them in September. So a lot of the plants that you do have, as far as nectar, we don't have them. The zinnias will be here still. Um, the cosmos, uh, but some of the, the Joe Pie. Sometimes, well, Joe Pye will be here, but some of the earlier ones um, are gone, and so it's, it's too late for them to use. But um, goldenrod is a good one. Uh, Gatorade's good, too. And they said that you couldn't use a hummingbird feeder to feed monarch butterflies. What do they know? They like, they like watermelon. <laughs> Uh, this, is a, this is called a great coneflower. This is a, a really neat kind of plant. It's very thick leaves. I don't have one here. Um, I have sold them. Um, very leathery thick leaves. If you have a problem with slugs, it's really good because the leaves get really good. 
and the slugs will come and eat them, and then you can put your beer in a little container, and you know, and uh, you can kill them. Uh, but I don't know if you see what's going on in this picture. I didn't see it either. I was there for 15 minutes taking pictures, so I'm just going to keep going here. Um, but we got this. You know, he's really going off on this um, on this uh, great cone flower, and it only has one. It, just one flower comes up, and it's really cool. It's uh, the flower's this big. And we keep going and going, and suddenly he started shaking. And I'm going, what is going on? And then his wings went down. Never seen one go down. And then he took off. That's why he did it. That is called a crab, that's called a goldenrod crab spider. He was there for 15 minutes, just watching those guys, and he just he did his little thing. Now these are really cool. These are these are neat. It's, it's called goldenrod. I mean, I looked it up. Crab looks like, or a spider looks like crab, yellow, and that one popped up. Uh, but that came in to the tent on the goldenrod. They also they're a chameleon. They can also be white or green. I have to store the butterflies in order to do what I do as far as with the tagging and, and with the releases. What you do with them is you put them in the refrigerator. You keep them down to about 48 degrees and they just they calm down. You don't have to feed them. You can keep them in there for about a week or so and then bring them out and feed them again and then take them back in. They'll stay for a very long time. This is what the, the farm, a lot of this I learned is from going to Monarch Butterfly Farms. You know, the guys that taught me how to, you know, people that taught me how to do a lot of this. A lot of it is just try and, trial and error. Um, there's about 50, and, 50 or 75 in that. Um, and this is the tag right here. And I don't, I can't, I, I should have gotten a picture of it or uh, one closer. But on this it says Monarch Watch. It has a code, uh, six digit code. It's got the website and it's got a 1-800 number. And it's about the size of your little pinky finger um, nail. And... Does the weight put them off balance? No, it doesn't. It doesn't affect it whatsoever. It no, it's, that's what's really neat about it. Uh, this is at Triana States. This is a little, what, not actually tagging, but we did release, this was a release of the, um, uh, of the breeders. And then the, the next generation of this one was the one that we're gonna that I tagged. People come in and they get to feed the butterflies. Uh, when I do the regular tagging, the big one, uh, the kids come in. Uh, I've done it at Fence. I've done it up at Sam's Club. Um, I've had two hurricanes, which prevented me from doing it twice. Uh, why are they in September? I don't understand that. <laughs> October hurricanes, really. Um, but with the kids, I have them actually name the butterfly. Yeah, so they get to, you know, they go and they pick their butterfly because they get to walk around and they get to, you know, try to entice one to come onto their little uh, piece of cotton that has uh, Gatorade on it. And uh, then they bring it over and we tag it and say, what do you want to name it? You know, oh, Rachel. Uh, <laughs> I had one little girl last year, Rose. She brought another one. What do you want this one? Rose. Another Five Rose. I said, that's it. <laughs> Um, best one I ever had uh, was hot lava. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> That's why I do it. <laughs> Although she's a very deadly little girl. <laughs> That's Magdalene. <laughs> she brings over six at a time. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can incorporate into your landscape. Uh, milkweed, this is in our front yard, and these are some common milkweed. Uh, Diane, how do you feel about this? It's invasive. See, I, when I had my midlife crisis, I told my wife, I'm either gonna build a greenhouse or buy a Harley Davidson. <laughs> She said, well, you can get killed on a Harley Davidson. I said, I know. And she goes, get the bike. <laughs> I built the greenhouse. 
This is along the side. But this is common milkweed. This will come up all the time. But you can put, this is beautiful in the garden, and it comes up. Uh, the uh, orange milk, or that uh, uh, butterfly weed, beautiful in the garden. It's a lot of, you know, a lot of the ones that are not as uh, invasive. But uh, this one you do have to keep really under control because it will find, you know, all of a sudden it'll, you'll find it in the middle of your uh, uh, you know, front yard and you didn't know how to get there. This is at Forbes um, Preschool. They've got a beautiful, this is just, took this just a couple of days ago. Uh, they have the beautiful zinnias all in the, in the front and uh, that's, that's a great magnet right there. Um, and that Monarch Watch Way Station. You can become a Monarch Watch Way Station just by contacting um, uh, Monarch Watch. Costs about, I don't know, $30 or so. It's for the sign. And then you tell them what you're going to do. They, they ask you how you're going to design, how, how, you know, because you can have it as big as, a, as big as this, or you can have it as big as this, or you can have as big as all this out here as far as your Monarch Way, way Station. It's just a matter of how you how you uh, plant. Uh, Citus provides milkweed nectar sources, uh, shelter needed to maintain monarch butterflies so they migrate through North America, certified and registered by Monarch Watch. They didn't give me a t-shirt. <laughs> okay, G resources for growing, Monarch Watch, University of Kansas, Life Monarch Foundation, lots of websites out there. Just uh, monarchs are really, um, really cool now. I always start things when they're not cool and then people start finding out what I'm doing and then they want to do it too. Um, Butterflybushes.com, Rose Franklin Perennials. This lady's a bomb. She is so good. Who is the one at the University of Kansas? That's... Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. I don't... I don't work with Monarch Watch. I just, I get my tags with them and everything I, you know, then I send the tags to them, but I don't really, I haven't really spoken to anybody there. Um, but Rose Franken perennials, you can get the eggs and the caterpillars. And you can buy about uh, 10 caterpillars for like 15, 20 bucks. Uh, she ships them to you. Uh, but you have to make sure if you're gonna do something like this that you want to have um, a lot of this. Seed companies, Prairie Moon Nursery is probably the best one to get for, uh, for the milkweeds because with the milkweed, they have more, they just, they just have more species of milkweed. Um, Wild Seed Farms, they have you know, a lot of nectar plants and things, they have a few uh, stock seeds. Baker's Creek, Baker's Creek is real, that's, I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's, This is what Prairie Moon Nursery sends you. You can go online and you can order this. Um, they have 1,500 different types of, of, of wildflowers. Everything you could possibly want. A lot of great, uh, great ones. Uh, this is a beautiful catalog. It's just nice to have on the, um, on the coffee table too. But they have a lot of, uh, a lot of the zinnias I get from them because they have really good, um, a good selection. And this is all heirloom. So these are not, these are not the ones that you're gonna buy that are um, hybrids. I don't do hybrids about anything because the reason you don't wanna use hybrids as far as, you know, they may be pretty flowers, but there's no nectar. There's no good stuff in there. And they don't, that's why they don't have a, have a smell. Um, so you wanna use, it's best to use, um, you know, just, just, uh, Heirloom. Uh, so you got oh, True Seeds up in Asheville. Um, Want to stay local? They've got some. Uh, they have. I think they sell rose milkweed, and I think I don't. I think they may sell common. Um, this is oh, sorry, but rose milkweed is also called swamp milkweed. Same thing. And. So my presentation is now over, and just remember, without the fodder, the mother got no place to put the eggs. <laughs> so plant milkweeds. Thank you.